Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are now at the real beginning of the modern era, the start of systematic, distinctively modern philosophy in the 17th century, after the intellectual transition from the medieval era has been completed. The systems propounded at this point in time will be decisive in shaping the course of subsequent philosophy. If there's any hope for the future of modern philosophy, you will have to get it tonight. The two philosophers that we will look at tonight, the ones who between them founded modern philosophy in a real way, are Hobbes and Descartes. Now, to give you a preview, I will simply tell you what to expect in a sentence to alleviate the suspense, if any. Hobbes is a derivative of the ancient materialists and ends up as a total sophistic skeptic. Descartes is a derivative of Plato and Augustine and implants the essence of the Platonic approach deeply into the very fabric of modern philosophy at its outset. <clears throat> Hobbes denies consciousness. Descartes, as you'll see, casts doubt on physical reality. Between them, modern philosophy begins in a disastrous fashion, and things got worse ever since. Now, if you ask me what about Aristotle, were there no major modern philosophers influenced essentially by Aristotle? I would answer if there is any such, and really there isn't, but if there is anyone to qualify, it would be John Locke. Which we will, whom we will consider next lecture, and you will see what a weak and at best semi, one-third Aristotelian he is. All right, with this advance word of warning, let us turn first to Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679. Now, Hobbes is the first British philosopher to construct a complete philosophic system on the basis of the discoveries of the new science. You recall last time we discussed the scientific discoveries and the scientific worldview which was formed on the basis of it. Hobbes takes his, as his starting point the view of the world propounded by the new science and proposes to bring all branches of philosophy for the first time under the new science. He is the first, or rather he is one of the first really influential and systematic modern philosophers. He is contemporary with Descartes. He is not as important or influential as Descartes. Therefore, he has not won from historians the title the father of modern philosophy. But you should not depreciate or detract from his importance. He is important. In a way, he was, uh, to pay, use a complimentary term in an ironic fashion, ahead of his time. His impact and influence were delayed. His metaphysics became enormously influential really only in the 19th century. His epistemology, ethics, and politics only in the 20th. In the 17th century, he primarily has the function of a horrible example to the other philosophers of the time uh, who regarded his conclusions as horrendous and who believed that they must avoid Hobbesianism at all costs. Now, I said that he claims to be the arch proponent of modern science. What then is his attitude to God, revelations, theology, etc.? Are they all out in his view? And the answer, in effect, is yes. Now, you should understand for accuracy that Hobbes himself is not an atheist. He frequently refers to God. He even gives the first cause argument in favor of God. He calls God an incorporeal spirit and suggests at certain points indirectly that God is the source of ethics. But none of this in Hobbes has any philosophic significance because it contradicts every element and principle of his distinctive philosophy. Some commentators hypothesize that Hobbes retained these references to God out of prudence. After all, it was still not 100% uh, safe politically to be an atheist. There were still religious authorities and persecutions at this time. And even beyond this reason, the 17th century is still too early for avowed atheism. Atheism really is not a cultural phenomenon until the later 18th and particularly 19th century. 
But we can ignore the religious vestige in Hobbes. By the logic of his philosophy, in consistency, he has to be an atheist. And virtually everybody takes him as that, in spite of these few uh, references. You know, there's often very bitter anti-religious remarks in Hobbes. For instance, when he goes to define religion, he explains that there are two kinds of fear, justified and unjustified. For instance, a justified fear would be the fear you feel if a wild animal is suddenly let you loose at you. An unjustified fear would be the fear that people feel in walking under a stepladder. Now, within the category of unjustified or irrational fear, he goes on, there are two kinds. Irrational fears, which are not publicly endorsed, that we call superstition. And irrational fears, which are publicly endorsed, that is religion. Now, you see, this is hardly a pro-religious viewpoint. He prides himself on being scientific, naturalistic, rational. He is, like all philosophers of this period, enormously conscious of epistemology, of method. You must have the right method to philosophize, he insists. And like uh, so many of the philosophers that we've seen and will continue to see, he believes philosophy must follow mathematics in its method, and specifically geometry, uh, which was the best developed, clearest example of mathematics known at this time. The essence of the proper method of philosophy is start with certain axioms or basic principles and then proceed rigorously to deduce their implications. Uh, according to Hobbes biographers, he uh, one day stumbled when he was not yet cognizant of geometry on the 47th theorem of Euclid. And he's read it, and he said, it's impossible. It can't be true. And he slowly worked his way back through the preceding theorems until he reached the axioms. And he is supposed to have said words to the effect of, by God, it really is true. And he promptly fell in love with geometry if it could give a demonstration like this. And this must be what philosophy is. It must be completely deductive, starting with the basic premises of science, which Hobbes takes as his starting point, and deducing their consequences for mankind in all realms. Well, let us look first very briefly at his metaphysics. He is a complete, thoroughgoing materialist. Matter in motion is all that exists. It is governed by the laws of mechanics, Everything happens exclusively by what Aristotle called efficient causation. There is no purpose, no end, no goal-directed behavior, nothing of what Aristotle called final causation anywhere in the universe. So this is a standard mechanistic materialism, in effect the billiard ball metaphysics. What about man? Well, man is no exception, he says, to the universal truths discovered by science. Man, too, is only a mechanistic materialistic entity. And therefore, man is completely determined. Free will is a myth. Everything is determined by the laws of motion operating upon matter. <coughs> Essentially, as you see, this is the metaphysics of the ancient materialists. What about mind, consciousness, spirit, soul? There are no such things, says Hobbes. Anybody who believes in these things simply shows that he is a holdover or carryover from the old-fashioned medieval religious period. These things have no place in a scientific philosophy. Science, he insists, demands materialism. Mind or consciousness is a supernatural legacy. We have dispensed with ghosts, he says. We have dispensed with demons. Now let us be consistent and dispense with mind also on the same ground. Your mind is supposed to be a spiritual entity. What is a spiritual entity? He said, if it means anything, it means a bodiless body. And a bodiless body is simply a contradiction in terms. So much for mind. Now, you see, I interject the false alternative here. The Platonists and Augustinians for centuries had been saying mind or consciousness or soul is a supernatural element the part of man akin to the world of supernatural forms or God. And Hobbes says, true, if there were a mind, that's what it would be, supernatural. Only, of course, he goes on, I reject the supernatural and therefore ends up as a materialist. In other words, he doesn't challenge the Platonist basic premise that mind is supernatural. He merely takes the other side of the same coin. And you'll see this same procedure again in his epistemology. 
If the mark of a great philosopher is his ability to challenge entrenched fundamentals, to think as an innovator in terms of basic principles, rather than merely accept the principles and alternatives already popular, then you have to say that Hobbes is not a great philosopher, not in any branch of philosophy. His attitude to mind, I may say, is very popular today, particularly among people who pride themselves on being, quote, scientific. And you can find it uh, defended by sundry physicists, vast numbers of psychologists, above all behaviorists. And we've already mentioned this under our discussion of Democritus. Now, I've already discussed what's wrong with materialism many lectures ago, so I won't repeat that now. You will see that a materialist always has to smuggle in consciousness in spite of himself whenever he deals with man, with cognition, with ethics, with politics. And you'll see that if we now turn to the most important part of Hobbes' philosophy, his epistemology. Now, as I said, it was destined his epistemology to be enormously influential, though not for a few centuries. In many respects, for those of you who know 20th century philosophy, you will see that Hobbes is a real 20th century soul. Uh, he is the blood brother and ancestor of the logical positivists and the pragmatists and that whole school which derives from uh, Anglo-American skepticism. Well, let's start his epistemology. All knowledge, he says, is based on the evidence of the senses. There are no innate ideas. In this respect, he is a thorough empiricist. There's nothing in the mind that was not ultimately based on sense experience. This, of course, is the attitude taken by modern science, by Bacon, by Galileo, and ultimately, of course, it is an Aristotelian element. <coughs> How does Hobbes, as a materialist, account for such a thing as sensory perception? Well, he says, matter external to our bodies strikes our bodies, according to the laws of mechanics, in certain places, those places which we call the senses, and that starts certain parts of our bodies quivering, oscillating, shaking, moving back and forth. This motion is communicated by various nerves and so on to the heart or brain. He didn't necessarily commit himself to the brain, but I'll leave out the heart hereafter. The appropriate part of which of the brain starts moving, and so we have a motion in the brain produced by the impact of external matter in our bodies. And that's a sensation, a motion in the brain. That's all it is. Now you say the sensation is the motion? Is it that, or is it that the motion appears to us or is experienced by us as a sensation? And Hobbes often says, yes, a sensation is really the way we experience the motions in our brain. Now, you might ask, why does motion in the brain yield a sensation, an experience, and not just motion, the way motion does when you strike any complex uh, machine? Who or what, you might ask, is doing the experiencing if there is no conscious entity? And you might ask, why does motion in the brain yield a world of green, red, hot, cold external objects rather than at least the experience of motion in the brain? Now, to all of these questions, Hobbes has no answer. On his premises, there is no answer. He has to assume and smuggle in consciousness. By his premises, there should be motion in the brain, and that's all. That somebody should know about it or experience it is inexplicable without consciousness. But we can pass by this problem because many others are pressing. We've said that somehow this motion in the brain produces the experience of an external world. Well, is our perception of the world valid? Can we trust the senses? Do they tell us what the world is really like? Answers Hobbes firmly, no, they do not. Why? Well, he accepted the distinction of Democritus and Galileo that there are two kinds of qualities. And we've already discussed this distinction the kind that Locke subsequently called the primary versus the secondary qualities. The secondary qualities, says Hobbes, colors, tastes, odors, etc., are merely the effects on us of what's really out there. The real world is therefore not remotely what it appears to be. It's colorless, odorless, soundless, invisible, temperatureless. All it consists of is quantities in motion, with size, with shape, with number. 
The senses, therefore, are great deceivers. Now, he says this quite explicitly, and I'll read you a very brief quote from him. Quote, whatsoever qualities our senses make us think there be in the world, they be not there, but are seeming and apparitions only. The things that really are in the world, apart from us, are those motions by which these seemings are caused. And this is the great deception of sense." Unquote. Now you see the contradiction he's in at the outset. All knowledge rests on the senses. And we didn't get off the ground before he's denouncing the senses. So you can figure out where we're going from there. Now you might ask the question, how can we know that the senses are deceiving us? And Hobbes answers, by thought. For instance, by the various arguments used by philosophers to establish that secondary qualities aren't real. The arguments I gave you last time, that we can't conceive of matter without the primary, but can without the secondary, or that the primary vary, uh, don't vary from perceiver to perceiver, and the secondary do. In other words, by a process of thought, says Hobbes, we can correct our senses. But he also says, that thought is based on the evidence of the senses. Now, how can thought correct the evidence on which it's based? If you're an empiricist and you say all knowledge rests on the senses, and then you say the senses deceived you, clearly you are lost. There's no means of correcting the senses if they're your sole foundation of knowledge. Now, of course, if you criticize the senses and take Plato's way out via innate ideas, that's a different story. But if you are an empiricist and denounce the senses, that is the equivalent of committing epistemological suicide and will lead simply to the view that reality is unknowable. And you'll shortly see Hobbes come to that conclusion. In any event, I'd like to introduce you now to some technical philosophic terminology. Hobbes' view is that we do not perceive reality directly. We only perceive the appearances of reality to us, the effects of reality on us the way it affects our brains and senses. We don't perceive reality directly, or we don't perceive it as it really is. In effect, we're all locked up inside our own minds, or let me correct that, inside our own brains, inasmuch as there is no mind. We know our own experiences directly, and that's all. Perception, therefore, is really a species of introspection. Looking out doesn't really exist. All looking out is a form of looking in. <clears throat> now, this viewpoint is called the causal theory of perception. The causal, C-A-U-S-A-L, the causal theory of perception. And it is defined technically as the view that reality is the cause, but not the object of our perception. Reality is the cause, but not the object of our perception. Now, you see, Aristotle, being an advocate of the validity of the senses, being a naive realist, says reality is the cause of our experience, and it is the object that we experience. We directly experience reality. We open our eyes, or whatever sense modality we use, and there is reality given to us. The advocate of the causal theory, however, says we do not directly experience reality, only the inner content of our mind as the result of the influence of reality on us. Reality, he says, to be sure, exists as the cause of our experience, but we don't directly encounter it. That is the theory called the causal theory of perception. Now, some advocates of the causal theory simply stop there and say reality is unknowable since we never encounter it. Some, like Hobbes, go on to say no. <coughs> some of our experiences are similar to reality and some are not. Some, in the technical uh, phrase, represent reality or stand for reality. Some do not. Of course, in Hobbes's case, the primary quality experiences represent reality. The others do not. If you add this point, you are said to believe in the representative theory of perception, which is the view that you do not directly perceive reality, only its effects on you, but that some of your experiences nevertheless are similar to or represent reality. Now, Hobbes subscribes to the causal theory and the representative theory of perception. Of course, if you ask him, since you never perceive reality, how do you know that some of your experiences represent it? Uh, that's what later thinkers asked him, but we'll wait and see for that. For now, I just hope you get clear the terminology, the primary-secondary quality distinction, 
the causal theory of perception, the representative theory of perception. Because the results of this trinity of ideas are disastrous. How do you know there is a reality at all if you're locked up experiencing your own subjective experiences? Well, of course, the advocates of this viewpoint say, well, there must be a reality which caused our experiences. That's the causal theory of perception. And the representative ones go on, I can infer something about reality in order for it to have caused the particular kind of experiences I have. That's the representative theory of perception. But their central point is reality is known by inference, not by perception, not directly, not self-evidently. Well, of course, later philosophy proceeded promptly to challenge this inference, to ask, why does there have to be an external world causing my experiences? Why couldn't God, for instance, directly cause my experiences in me, which is the position taken by Bishop Barclay? Why does there have to be a cause at all? Why, let's go by the observed facts. All we observe is our own experiences. That's therefore all we have a right to believe in, which is the position taken by David Hume, who threw out the law of cause and effect along with reality. Now you'll see that by this route, the whole external world will shortly vanish. However, that's looking ahead. Hobbes still believes in reality. There is an external reality, and he thinks that our senses are trustworthy, at least in regard to the primary qualities. But the process of destruction of reality, as you see, has started. Now, there is more to mental processes than simply sensing. Uh, Hobbes holds that every so-called mental process can be explained strictly materialistically and mechanistically, in a rigidly <coughs> deterministic fashion. All so-called mental activity is really motion in the brain. <coughs> For instance, you have a particular sensation. Then that sensation starts to be interfered with by other motions as new stimuli strike your senses and start up new motions. And so says Hobbes, the original motion begins to decay, that is his word. And you experience it therefore as somewhat fainter and more blurred than you did the original sharp experience. And that's due to the new motions which are entering your brain and obscuring the old motion. Now this decaying sense is called imagination or memory. And by imagination here, we mean the faculty of forming mental images. For instance, uh, right now, form before your eyes a visual image. You can have images in any sense modality, but the commonest are visual, so we will restrict ourselves to that. Right now, form before your eyes a mental image, let us say, of your mother, of her face. Now. What is the explanation of that, says Hobbes? Well, at one point, you actually perceived your mother, and that started certain motions going in your brain. And those motions, by the law of inertia, have still been there. Only other motions have come in to obscure them. Now, when you go to look at your mother, you're seeing a faded, decayed sensory image, a sensory experience, and that is an image, you see. If this happens while you're sleeping, you're said to be dreaming. And this is why images are fainter and paler and more blurred. <coughs> well, now we reach a crucial point. <coughs> what about thought? Abstract thought, concepts, man's cognitive distinction and glory. How does it fare in this philosophy? Well, to tell you the brutal truth in a sentence, Hobbes equates thought with image. He equates thought with image. Image, idea, thought, concept. All those are synonyms for Hobbes. And of course, an image we know is simply a decaying sense experience. And a thought, therefore, or an idea, or a concept is really only a sense experience or an image thereof. Now, this viewpoint also has a technical name I'd like you to know. It's called sensualism, or sometimes sensationalism. But I call it sensualism because it's shorter. Now, sensualism is an epistemological theory. It has nothing to do with orgies. Sensualism is the doctrine that all cognitive elements really are sense perceptions. All cognitive elements really are sense perceptions. Or to put it another way, it is the view that man has only one cognitive faculty, the faculty of sense perception. 
that the power of thought is not a distinct cognitive faculty, but simply a form of the faculty of sense perception. Now, uh, please do not confuse sensualism with empiricism. There is a vital distinction there. Empiricism is the broader of the two terms. It is the view that all knowledge begins with experience, that there is no innate ideas. But that leaves open two possibilities. A philosopher, given an empiricist base, can then go on a la Aristotle and say, granted all knowledge begins with experience, man nevertheless has the power of abstraction, and therefore the power of forming concepts which are not simply names for sense experience. And therefore, the, a power to gain a knowledge of reality by reason and thought, which he couldn't have gained exclusively from sense perception, even though it's ultimately based on it. That would be an Aristotelian empiricist. A sensualist is a radically anti-Aristotelian empiricist. He believes with empiricism that all knowledge begins with the senses, but he is, in effect, a pessimistic empiricist. He believes that knowledge not only begins with the senses, but ends with the senses. His view is the senses is the only cognitive faculty man has, the senses plus their decayed remnants images. And therefore, what cannot be learned by sense perception simply cannot be known. There is no such thing as acquiring knowledge by reason other than what you could acquire by perception. That is the uh, sensualist view. It is particularly attractive to modern empiricists. You will be hard put to find any empiricist who is uh, in the modern world who is not a sensualist, uh, which for a reason which I'll explain shortly. Now, why do I stress sensualism, which is a vital issue in philosophy? <laughs> Because consider what happens to abstract conceptual thought if you are a sensualist. Now, images, like perceptions, like sense perceptions, are thoroughly individual, particular, concrete. If you consider the image that you had of your mother, well, let's take even a better case. Suppose I tell you form the image of banana. You cannot form an image of banana in general. If you inspect your image, even if it's blurred, focus on any part of it, and you'll see your banana is either yellow or green or brown. Uh, it's big or it's small. It's on its end or it isn't. It's got stripes or it hasn't. It's peeled or it isn't. And if you have a, the capacity to form tactile images, as some people do, you either taste an acrid image or whatever it happens to be. That banana image and all images across all modalities are thoroughly particular, even if blurred. Animals have the capacity for images. If thought is only decaying sense, if it's only particular images, how do men differ from animals? Now, it used to be said man can abstract. He can grasp universals, not just gaze at concretes. And that he grasps universals by a process of thought. But if thought is just another name for decaying sense perception, then how does man grasp universals? How does he grasp common denominators? How is he enabled to abstract? Or does he? And if not, how does man achieve his uniquely human attainments? 